there is blind justice, and then there is trading justice, so that you can finally afford to get that laser eye surgery. Not only will people find you more attractive once you ditch those old glasses, you'll be able to see your charts better. That's what we call win-win. Speaking of winning, it's time for a little trading justice. Brought to you by TackleTrading.com. Matt Justice for Trading Justice with Tim Justice, my co-host. Tim, how are you tonight? You know, Matt, I can't complain one bit, and I wouldn't even want to. Uh, the sky is beautiful outside. Just had an amazing meal with my wife, and just kind of sitting down, digesting the week, and also that food, I guess. And uh, just thinking about the market last week, and just enjoying it. Well, um, yeah, weather's nice. I'm sitting here in Brooklyn, New York, right now. I've been here for three days, and uh, I've never been to Brooklyn. I've been to Manhattan a couple times downtown, seen all the uh, tour sites down there. Been walking around Brooklyn uh, the last couple nights. And I got to tell you, this town's amazing. I've been to New York twice. Uh, went on my honeymoon there, and I hadn't even thought of the story in a while. But when we got there, we were so jazzed up and excited to get there. We get to the hotel, and it's early afternoon. And we're thinking, "Well, man, let's go see the city. Should we take a cab? No, let's not take a cab. You know, we want to act. I, you know, I want to walk. I want to ha- smell the smells and see the people." And I looked at a map. And we were down in Times Square, and we were going to walk down to the Natural History Museum. I think it was that. It might have been. And then there's a – what's that famous museum that's like in a circle, circles, spirals all the way up at the Guggenheim or something like that? Yeah. And we we walked the whole way. Unbeknownst to me, uh, it was like a far four miles place. one way or five miles or something like that. Yeah, I'm sure My your poor wife, wife had blisters really on her feet that. the whole time. Oh, I, Just, I, I can see it right now. You're probably thinking to yourself – This is an awesome idea. We're going to walk down there. We're going to see the sights. It's going to be amazing. And your wife is just staring at you the whole time thinking, what in the hell is wrong with you? (laughs) Well, she didn't think that until we hit the middle of Central Park. And if I'm remembering the story correctly, and then she's like, well, do you think it'd be faster to just bolt east or west and find a cab? I'm like, no, nah, we got to be getting close. Don't worry about it. We walked the entire way through the park. Listen, I know your wife. She's an amazing person. I love your wife. And there is no way she said it like that. She wasn't happy. <laughs> I was but say, there's no a long zero time chance. ago. Yeah. Zero chance. <laughs> I bet you there was a couple, what in the hell is wrong with you? You made me do what? You know, yeah, but then I went. I went out there a couple of years ago with you, if you remember. We went to that money show. Yeah, we were staying in the uh, Marriott Marquis downtown Times Square, and uh, if I remember right, uh, this is back in 2009 or 10, I can't remember. Yeah. And uh, we didn't actually see a whole lot of the money show because um, number one, it was like our first time to New York together, uh, yeah. and and number two, uh, we were having a little bit of fun and uh number three the money show was kind of god awful oh man we were karaoke in that irish bar a couple of country kids bringing the house down the, we brought the party to new york new, yeah new york doesn't understand two kids from emory county utah they they don't understand what they're in for and <laughs> oh, that irish were... pub just was absolutely i mean they took us in like kindred spirits Amazing. You know, as a tourist, I, I've learned I've, – I've done this in San Francisco and, and pretty much everywhere I go. you got to get off the, the tourist traps and go you find get off the, grid, you know, the local spots. Yeah, and I, I did get to meet the guy. This, this is one moment that I'll never forget. I actually got to meet Lawrence McMillan at that money show. Do you know who that is? Yeah, I know. Bible of Options. Yeah, I know Lawrence Yeah. McMillan. When I first started trading, that was the first book, options book I read. It's a damn those thousand you don't know pages it. that won't teach you a damn thing. Well, I probably only read like 300 pages because I skipped the parts I didn't think I needed and I you know, skipped around. Yeah. But um, I read that book and I thought, oh, this guy's amazing. And then I met him and he's just such a unimpressive man. I don't want to <laughs> run down Lawrence McMillan yeah, dude, tonight. You don't, you don't want that bad karma on you, but it's, it's true, you know. It doesn't mean they're not absolutely amazing traders and fantastic traders, but it, you know when you grow up I, and you come into this industry and this business and you read about these just amazing traders and they write these awesome books and you know they're just they're like an icon so to speak, right? You know the Steve yeah. Nissons and the Lawrence McMillans of the world, and it, when you get to meet them, because you know I, I have not met McMillan, but I have met Nissan as you have, and it's it's you have this moment of time and you're thinking like. 
this is not like meeting Dan Marino. Right, you know, right. It's, it's just you not. You got the same. this image that it's Brad Pitt on the other end somehow. I don't know. Maybe that makes me a, a little bit. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to go down that line of thinking. But fifty-seven percent. Um, I'm just throwing the number out there. It's a probability. You guys can take it where it is. But no, it's it's amazing that you're going to meet these individuals at the money show, and you're thinking to yourself, you're like, man, how in the world did you ever write a book? Thousand page book that I loved every word of it. You know, yeah, and oh, that's yeah. where I, you know, that's where. Honestly, I joke, but it's you don't you should never judge a book by its cover. Literally, to use to kind of I use don't a cliche. Joke. That's like War and Peace for the trading world. It's a thousand pages, and it's all just basic rules. You know, yeah. it's it's no, I don't. I'll tell you right now, and I'll tell you my personal opinion. Maybe it's the fact that I'm in New York, and the New Yorkers have influenced me a tad bit. It's, you know, for those of you who've been to New York, they they have a tendency to speak their mind regardless of what they think. And uh, I'll tell you right now, I think uh, people who write books, and you know, more than likely, you and I will write a book eventually. So this will come back to haunt me. But you know, people write a book, and they make things so difficult. And that's the number one problem I have with Macmillan's book is it it makes trading options like the most difficult thing in the world. And it just reminds me of the traditional mentality out there as a whole that. Only Wall Street can do this. Only the professionals can do this. And that's how technicians write books. That's how, you know, uh, options traders write books. That's how stock traders write books. It makes them feel really important about themselves when trading options is actually very straightforward. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very descriptive. Yeah. And, you know, I think what it is, and, and this is why, this is where you'll see like uh, boxers and athletes that ne have never necessarily written a book, like John Stockton. You know, son of you know the Utah Jazz, beloved in Utah. He's coming out with a book, but he's going to have it. Uh, what do they call it when it, somebody else writes it? Ghost written. Yeah, yeah, it's going to have a ghost. Or whatever you want to call it. I don't even know if that's the right phrase, but it somebody is. else is writing it for him, just telling his story. And my friend was like complaining, "How am I going to buy John Stockton's book when he's not even going to write it?" And I said, "Do you think he's just like took a class on writing books and he's going to be able to write?" What do you I think mean, writers do? <laughs> That's what yeah. writers do. They sit down, they interview you, they they put your words into a an, a place where people can read it coherently. You know, yeah. I mean, could you imagine sitting down and reading a 250 page you know manual about what I just wrote? It's, I couldn't imagine that. You know, when I'm going to write my book, I guarantee I'm going to have somebody help me write it. Guarantee it. I'm not Got a writer. It. I'm not. I'm not even going to pretend to be a writer. Well, it is a skill that I think you could develop, just like any skill. Oh, well, but yeah. To, I mean, I can pick pages, up a guitar though? as well, but it doesn't mean that I can, you know, write. Doesn't mean you're Jimi Hendrix, <laughs> like John Steinbeck, right? <laughs> exactly. I can't. I'm not Jimi Hendrix. No, I don't think I'll ever be. But it does get that back to the to a question. Actually, this is very interesting that our our conversation is going this way. Is can something be learned, or is it innate? I recently uh, – you should look this up. I'd grab you the link. I'll send it to you on in email or something. I recently took a quiz that um, they give to four-year-olds yeah. in the elite preschool classes in New York City. So these – imagine the tuition for these classes. Yeah. I only got three out of the five questions. No, two out of the five questions right, Matt. I'm not shocked by that. It was all these pattern-based things. It's like find – the flag that's supposed to go next. And frankly, I actually am not bad at that kind of stuff. And I could only figure out two out of the five. Um, some stuff I think is innate. But other skills can be learned. Well, and there's no doubt in my mind that's 100% true. You know, back in the, the 70s and 80s and even some, somewhat into the 90s, it was not as remotely easy as it is today for a retail investor to learn how to trade. We didn't have the same technology. We didn't have the same access to news. We didn't have easy order entry. We didn't have these technology technology programs. We didn't have online brokers. We didn't have ETFs to track the market. I mean, today's trading world is just an infinitely different world. But I will tell you this. I was sitting here in Brooklyn, New York, and I'm sitting here teaching a group of just awesome students. i got to tell you about a couple of them. Uh -huh. And... I was telling them because it, when people first learn how to trade or start the process of learning how to trade, they have a tendency to question themselves. They have a tendency to tell themselves they can't do it. They have a tendency to get overwhelmed by detail, and they have a tendency to get 
just really fearful about I need this, but I just I'm not smart enough. I can't do it. I don't have enough time. I'm scared. I don't have enough money. All of those are just excuses that really don't matter in any capacity. But um, the reality is, in 1983, you had an individual by the name of Richard Dennis, and Richard Dennis started the Turtle Traders. And for the first time in history, Richard Dennis proved that you know you could bring somebody with no knowledge, no background. You didn't have to be Ivy League, you know, educated. You didn't have to be the top five percent of the intelligence in the universe. Uh, and you could learn how to control your money and 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 get your financial freedom. And he proved that out with the Turtle Traders. And that was way back in 1983, Tim. That was way back when you know the retail investor didn't have what the Wall Street trader had. Today we have all the same advantages. In, in fact, you might argue that the retail investor actually has a leg up on Wall Street. The only thing they're missing is really knowledge. Well, they're, they're, I would argue both sides, and I'll tell you why. Obvi the biggest advantage Wall Street has is they are corporations. They're not individuals. In my opinion, this is a big part of it, and what I mean by that is there's no emotion involved. Mm -hmm. Lehman Brothers can literally go bust, and the, the guys who ran Lehman Brothers get – cushy severance packages. They, to, they still get paid off their stock options, and uh, then whatever they, they had. Sachs. Their contracts get paid, and then they just go work for Goldman Sachs or Merrill Lynch or whatever. Yeah. Um, so there is no fear, in my opinion, from Wall, uh, most of Wall Street. Now, those pit traders who take on some of their own risk or they could get fired, those guys got fear, middle management. But the yeah. institution they don't, they're not afraid. I mean, well, they, they've been running this scam I, I agree forever. With that. I agree with that. And, and that did change with the subprime market where we bailed them out and we gave them basically a get-out-of-jail-free card um, so, so that they could take inherent risk without the, without the actual true risk. So that's their biggest advantage. They don't have to worry about that part of it. So as an individual, if we can recognize our disadvantage, we're human beings with human flaws – if we can embrace the advantages and build protections around our disadvantages, that's where we can find success in I, trading. I, I agree with that, but as the individual, as a retail and trader and whatnot, don't we also have advantages that Wall Street doesn't have? That's you know, what I was just going to get to. And, and yeah. Honestly, I mean, if you look at somebody like a George Soros or a Warren Buffett or a hedge fund or an institution, they cannot move with the, the speed that we can. They're the Titanic. We're a speedboat. We can get in and out of trades faster. We can allocate faster. We can adjust faster. We can manage faster. And when, and especially when the market starts breaking down, we can completely adjust portfolios in a matter of moments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And that's not a small thing. That's a huge thing. Um, people wonder, you know, they look at returns from, say, hedge funds, institutions, and they say, well, how do, you, how do individual traders make more than that? Because smaller accounts actually have the ability, you know, percentage-wise, to actually make better money with mm -hmm. the same skill set. You and I, if, let's say that we went and we had a good successful year at some big bank with lots of money. We ran a huge portfolio. You did if we use the same techniques in an individual account, we might be able to make more money in the individual account because you can kind of fly under the radar. Well, also, you know? think about it like this. It's, it's always easier when you manage less money to do a higher percent return. And just think about from a macro level. The two, great, the two biggest economies in the world are the U.S. and the Chinese economy. The U.S. economy is right around $16.2 trillion, and the Chinese economy is about $8 trillion. It's easier to move eight trillion than it is sixteen and trillion. Would you agree? Yes. Okay. So China, China does a you know seven percent growth. U.S. does a two percent growth. But which one has actually more output? The U.S. economy does. Uh, and the same thing goes with like when you look at the different market indexes. When you look in the S and P five hundred or the Dow Jones, it's it's not as fast as the Russell two thousand because the Russell two thousand is full of small and mid cap stocks versus the S and P and the Dow that's full of those, you know, the five billion, ten billion, fifty billion, hundred billion dollar companies. Mm -hmm. So th that's just yeah. inherent in everything. Well, we and there's a lot I want to get into with the markets. I think these are major points, but we did miss something. That you, I'm not. I got to ask you something real quick about your trip to New York. Yeah. Number one, where have you had dinner? You know, sad to say, I don't even know if it's sad to say. I ate at this like shake 
shack. Oh, no, that's great. It was like a burger joint, shake joint. Uh, I had a burger there last night. Burger was amazing. Just uh, kind of found some spot. Yeah, you know, it was, it was really good. And then to, uh, tonight I took my crew out to uh, barbecue. And <laughs> amazingly, I think we found the, the number one Texas joint in New York. <laughs> you know, it, it was like straight, like, you know, brisket and, uh, you know, ribs and, sure. you know, you name it. It was just, it was, it was old fashioned Texas barbecue. I'll tell you right, like picnic tables and, you know, everything like that. I have a friend who I'm going to bring on for a podcast. I'll leave his name until he confirms, but he actually runs a bond portfolio for Bank of America. He's been a light, I mean, we used to be college roommates. And he went to school in New York. After we got out of undergrad, he got his master's degree there in business. And he lived in at, he went to NYU. And when we went to New York um, for my honeymoon, he was out there at NYU for his uh, business degree. But he happened to be out of town visiting family or something. So I didn't get to catch up with him there. And I asked him where to eat. First thing he said was Korean barbecue. So really? we went and we went found some Korean barbecue place. It kind of felt like a hole in the wall, and it was amazing. You, you know, know, I, I so think when, the best food is in hole in the wall. So, yeah, you know, so your your answer is acceptable to me. Yeah. I I am a big uh, critic of people who leave their place and then they go to another place and just find something they could have found at home. Like uh, go, you leave by uh, Utah and you decide, okay, we're in, you know, Brooklyn, New York, but you know, Chili sounds good. Right. I'll, I'm going to do the downtown yeah. or the Applebee's. <laughs> Let's do Applebee's. Times Square Applebee's. Yeah, yeah. exactly. That's utterly ridiculous. No, we found this barbecue joint, and it was really, really good. You know, we ate there. We got fat and full, and, you know, we uh, just kind of called it a day after a hard, after a really good day, but a hard day. Sounds amazing. Yeah. yeah, when I was out there, I hit papaya dog. I mean, I had to hit all the food trucks. I mean, I that, that's my kind of thing to do. So when you said shake, shack, that's you, – you're well, talking about Well, I'll tell you right now, t I was so excited to – uh, come to New York and go to a vendor and get just a just a dog, right? I was yeah. just so excited just to you know slap some stuff on that, let me eat it in the street, you know, just make dirty, have you know drip mustard on myself, and then just go back and go to bed. And you know what? I went to a vendor, and you know what? They did not have a hot dog. They didn't have hot dogs, kebabs or something. No, 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 no. They they had a hot dog on. The cart. They said they had hot dogs. They, they were didn't ready. Have a hot dog? No, oh. they didn't have them. Did I? False marketing. I'll tell you right I now. I see. I see. You got cheated out of it. I do. I feel bad. I feel like I'm cheated. I feel like uh, I don't. I just. I think New York kind of screwed me over on that one. Oh, this, cut, this next week's gonna be big, Matt. In the market? Yeah. I think. Uh, yeah. I think so. Um, you know, we had a little bit of a sell-off this week, uh, especially a couple days there uh, on Tuesday and Wednesday. Uh, small cap stocks, mid cap stocks got beat up big time this week. Uh, I don't know what that means for the overall market itself, but you know, when the when you look at the S and P 500 and the Dow, you know, it really wasn't that much. You know, they <laughs> were down the week a percent. So I, I don't I don't think I honestly. It's a big week because of earnings, Tim. It's a big week because we've got 100 S&P 500, 500 companies reporting earnings. Um, but this sell-off in the week this week, I could even categorize it as sell-off. I mean, Well, the only people that would have even known as a sell-off are active traders because big names took had some volatility. Tesla, CMG, those types, they had some kind of weird days, you know, like uh, mm -hmm. CMG on Tuesday dropped all the way down, came back up. So if you weren't actively trading, you wouldn't even have noticed it. It would have been another blip on the screen. So for the public, for the average guy, just another week in, Ma in Wall Street, you know, not well, much going on. I want to ask you something because coming into this week, we did a podcast. And we were talking about the expectations in the week and you can always plan on what we know, right? And mm -hmm. what we knew coming into this week was the Fed minutes and it was interesting what the Fed said. The Fed, the one thing the Fed said this week that was a little different in my estimation was they, they expressed a little bit of a concern that Wall Street was taking advantage and taking too large of a speculative position on the bullish market. And I thought that was a little different. I, I haven't really heard the Fed say that. And it's something that we have known for years, right? I mean, mm -hmm. traders, investors, active people have known this for years that Wall Street was basically buying up stocks because Fed was giving them free money. But the Fed came out and said it. 
And I believe the Fed has known this for years as well. But I think it was a warning shot across the bow to the to the Wall Street traders. Mm. You're far more optimistic about human behavior than I am. Uh, I I think it was a we're going to cover our ass for later when things get bad statement. So that might be a little bit. Of, <laughs> I, I could definitely we're, see we're a little gonna, bit of that. We're going to start calling the emperor out as being naked you know that old emperor has no clothes yeah, moment no so that when the reality does hit we can say well we've been talking about this all along so now we're going to take other corrective actions i no i i agree with you 100 percent. i agree with you i'm just saying for the first time the fed comes out and they actually acknowledge it i think they've known it for years okay oh, yeah, they years know. and i'm not saying that the fed is absolved in what they have done I will be on record and have been on record and have been on record for years now as saying the Fed is causing the next bubble, that they're going to cause the next crash, and the next crash will be worse than what we saw in the subprime. And you can put a bullseye on the Fed from a responsibility standpoint. I'm just saying for the first time the Fed came out and acknowledged that Wall Street was taking too large of a risk from a speculative or a directional standpoint, and they were telling, and they were basically telling Wall Street, Hey, listen, guys, we see what you're doing. We're telling the public, and we're just kind of covering our asses because something is coming. You know, I have more stories that I have not told about myself than I have told. Um, here's one that you just reminded me of. There's a Federal Reserve branch downtown. Yeah. Just, And I'm not talking about big things, just little, th little quirky things I like to do just to keep myself sane or borderline. I don't know how I wanted to find that. But um, – there's a Federal Reserve branch downtown Salt Lake City that I walk by when I do my walks. You know, I like to walk around the city and see the people and talk oh, to the definitely guy, guys on the street and everything. I walked in. I was just in a weird mood one day. The market, I had a good day in the market, and I was just kind of in a happy, weird mood, and I wanted to mess with somebody in a fun way. I thought it would be funny anyway. And I walked in the Federal Reserve building, and it looks like you're walking into – I mean, they have metal detectors. Yeah. And well, uh, important, they have armed you know? guards. And I walk in there, and I'm like, uh, "You guys uh, sell T-shirts here?" Oh, uh, you don't mess with the security of the Fed, Penny, man. <laughs> and that is not like, a good decision. Uh, I'm like, uh, "Do you guys like do? Do you guys have like a gift shop or something? You sell T-shirts? Because I'm a trader, and I I would love to wear like a I love the Fed T-shirt or something." Dude, you <laughs> guys looked to, at me like they were gonna pull their you're gun. Gonna, hey, you're gonna have to print that <laughs> on your own because that's like messing with the TSA at airports. You do not do that. You tell the joke in your head, you laugh to yourself, and you walk away and print the T-shirt yourself. Because right. they're no joke, man. They, they will, they, they'll put you down, put the knee in the back. Well, you know how most people have that um, filter where they think of something that they they know would be funny to them, but yeah, they we don't, don't do filter. it. I don't always have that filter. I feel I'm like a strainer. I filter out most of it, but something always gets through. I don't know what I am. I don't know if I have a strainer. Um, I definitely you're like say, a. I definitely you're like a floodgate. You hold it back, and then it just and, comes until it's you're done. <laughs> yeah, it, that's true. That's true. Then I, pay, then I paint myself into a corner and I try to fight myself out. So. Well, here's a question. Just a simple logistics question. Yeah. I, I wrote a, a. Oh, what do you call them? A newsletter on our site. Tradingjustice.com, by the way, which is why what we tie into this podcast. You minutes. can find us on iTunes 23, and site. 23.37 seconds, uh, and we first plugged the website. That, there, there's times where I don't think we – I think we do a podcast without actually plugging the website, and absolutely nobody knows how to find us. We nobody just, will find we, us. We just start yeah. talking, and that's all we care about. Well, that's why I wanted to be the plug guy, but then we start talking about you know the market conditions and the Fed, and we go off on stories. But that's what the podcast is to me, you know, just our viewpoint on what's happening in the market and the conversation. You know, I like to think of it as a conversation over coffee or whatever. It's it's that's, a conversation it between people. two traders, and right. you know, the amazing thing, Tim, is you know, for our viewing audience out there, right. We, we, tend, we have a tendency to plan what we're going to talk about like two days in advance. And when we plan guest speakers, we try to plan them a couple days in advance. And we typically, within the first 38 seconds, have a tendency to forget the entire game plan and just talking about whatever we want to. Well, that's why I always bullet point stuff. And by the way, I do have a guest lined up. I'll uh, be – you know about him. I got to confirm that he's going to be here 
this weekend to do one, but it will be a great podcast. It's an ex student, can't give his name out till he confirms it for sure, but I think I know a who really you're talking successful about. trader. I think I know who you're talking about, and I will tell you, I am so excited to hear his take on trading, his experience, and kind of how he went about changing what he was doing and really kind of creating a, a system of, uh, all into himself. Well, I'll tell you a story here. I was talking to him today, actually, to confirm. And he's, his wife's about to have a baby. That's why he can't nail it down 100%. But he told That's me something That's not performance. That, that is not an excuse. All right. Well, I have other stories, but we got things to talk about. So, But he did tell me something that I found to be very heartfelt towards me. He's, and uh, I don't like to talk about myself much. But that when he came out twice, to mentor right? with me in 2010, he was in debt up to his eyeballs. He had just gotten out of law school, and he was negative net worth. Like if yeah. you ask somebody, like, what is your valuation? How much net worth do you have in cash? If you liquidated everything, he was negative net worth based on his debts and everything. And from his trading income, because I was nominating him for our Hall of Fame, he says, Tim, you know, I don't know if I deserve to be in there. I've not been real active the last – couple of months with the baby coming and everything I've, I've been doing you know I've only been trading real conservatively I've only made a couple of percent a month and I said Steve it's context it shows people that he said you know I'll tell you an interesting story though I wanted to go on a vacation so I told um, my wife give me two days to trade and we'll see if I can make the profits and I hit him and we took we went on a vacation well, not only is he out of his negative net worth he paid down his, his debt from school he paid down a lot of his wife's debts that she carried from other transactions and whatnot. And now he has the confidence to be able to tackle the market whenever well, he wants to and make money. And honestly, Tim, this was about uh, six, eight months ago because I know Steve a little bit as well. Not Obviously not as well as you do. We weren't saying his name. You just, just said his name. You just dropped it 35 seconds ago. <laughs> you just said Steve. <laughs> You know, but there's a lot all of right. Steves. There's a lot of Steves. Nobody knows what we're talking about yet. All right. Um, all right. But uh, he posted. He posted on Facebook. He he posted that. Uh, you know, after I don't know how long it has, but it, it's. I think it's like a decade that he finally had paid off his student loans, and he had paid off his student loans through his trading, and that's exactly the type of individual that we want to bring on because they're amazing. Yeah. So that yeah. that one's gonna that one's gonna be really good. I'm I'm excited for that. Uh, I got to tell you real quick about a student here, um, and I, I just I'll tell you, you know, I told this a story. I tell a story every every now and then about a student because I meet so many people around my travels and whatnot. But there's a guy, he's an ex army guy, and by the way, for those military guys that uh, you know, men and women who serve and whatnot, thank you very much for your service. Um, and honestly, I say that with a, you know all of my heart in the world because it allows us to do what we do, right? Uh -huh. um, but uh, I'll tell you, the military mindset is such a great trader's mindset. Uh -huh. it, it's discipline and structured, and they're just absolutely badass when it comes to you know most things in life, but uh, trading as a whole as well. Well, there's a guy that uh, is um, from the army, and He's up there and he's front row student and he's just so intent. The the last two days we just got done with day two of the workshop, and uh, this guy just you know on breaks he comes up and talks to me, and he you know I brought him up and I said okay. Uh, I was teaching the just you know strike prices, expiration dates, you know uh, intrinsic value, time value, uh, you know all that stuff, right? And, yeah. I, you know, I, I could see him struggling with it. And I said, okay, come on up here. You know, I won't say his name, but come on up, face your audience, face your peers, teach these people what in the money, at the money, out, out of the money is. Teach these people what intrinsic value and extrinsic value is. Not easy for a new trader, right? Mm. And, you know, it's, it's amazing how, you know, four times as many people fear public speaking as they do death. It's like the number one fear in the world is public speaking. And he got up and he just stared at my screen and just started just kind of taking his pen and pointing to the different numbers and, you know, just trying to figure it out, figure it out, figure it out on his own. And I drew it for him on a paper. And I said, just follow, follow my guidelines, follow my guidelines. And he just, you know, he wasn't getting it because it's not coming easy to him, but he kept fighting, he kept fighting, he kept fighting. And literally, you know, it, it, it was probably only three, four minutes, but it felt like 15 for me, right? Because I was just hoping. Right. And hoping Imagine and hoping. what it felt like for him. It, it probably felt like two hours for him. Yeah. 
And right. I put my hand on his shoulder and I said, okay, let me help you out. Okay, look at these ones. You see the color code? Those are in the money. These are out of the money. These are in the money. These are out of the money. And we just went through the repetition of it just like three or four times. And I pulled up stock after stock and I said, okay, which one's the strike price? And he just started nailing it in the money, out the money, in the in the money, out the money. And he comes up to me uh, in the afternoon and he starts asking questions. And you, you know, you, you've taught long enough to how when you're starting getting a series of questions about how you know somebody's getting it, right? How uh -huh. they're asking the right questions. They're, they're asking the questions that need to be asked in terms of understanding and truly learning something. And then he comes up, up to me after the class. Everybody's gone. He's sitting there, and I'm kind of putting everything away. And he comes up, and he starts asking more questions. And I said, why, why aren't you, you know, just asking during class? Because I like a lot of questions during class. He goes, Matt, uh, my drill sergeant, I never asked in front of public. I took him aside when I had questions. That's, how I'm, that's just how I am. And we had a great conversation. And he was getting it. He was understanding. And at the end of the day, Tim, we were, we were pulling up a stock and we were analyzing it technically. And we were analyzing, I think it was um, Whole Foods. And Whole Foods has been one of the worst performers in the stock market for the last six months, right? Just uh -huh. absolutely getting butchered. And Whole Foods is sitting on a support level right around, you know, $37.5, $38. And I, I was basically questioning him to kind of see where he was. I said, okay, so what breaks this level? What are we going to do? <coughs> and he says, uh, we're going to buy a put option. I said, what, what is that called? And he said, long put. And I said, okay, good. And what delta are we going to buy? And he says, point, uh, the closest to 0.60. I said, okay, good. What expiration month? He goes, two plus expiration. This is a guy who could not explain to me what in, at, or out of the money was at the beginning of the day. And because of his hard work, his dedication, and his fighting through the fear of not being able to get it, at the end of the day, he was not only spotting a breakdown in Whole Foods, he was also spotting, okay, we're going to buy this expiration, we're going to, or we're going to buy this strike price in this expiration, and we're going to do two plus expectancy, which is an extremely advanced, you know, type of concept. And I, I'll tell you right now, I was just so proud of him. I was just so yeah. proud of him. And it's people like that that, I, you know, and I've said this before, but I'll say it a thousand other times. You know, you just want to go out of your way to help those types of people. Oh, 100%. And that's one of the, you know, they say this is a very like Buddhist term, Buddhist way of thinking, but, but service is one of the most selfish acts that you can, you can do. I think I've talked about this on the podcast previously, yeah. and that's part of it. You know, you, you see people grow, you see stories like this, this man that you're talking about, um, you know, make improvement just over a few days. I see students of mine that used to be, that are now colleagues of mine, like the Steve guy we're saying that we're going to bring on the podcast. You know, it's, it's really a selfish thing because you get such self-fulfillment out of mm -hmm. it. And you get such pride in, as a teacher, an instructor. It really validates what you do when you see your students succeed. Um, people ask me all the time, why do you do it? Why don't you just do other stuff? Well, I mean, because I like to you know, work with people. I'm a people it's, person. It's cliched, I, I like, it's cliched yeah. as it is. And I'll tell you what, it's the honest to God truth. Uh, you get such fulfillment over seeing people achieve their, achieve what they want to put out there. And that's why yeah. teachers teach, you know, it, you know, and you've, you heard Mike Kleinhan say it, you heard Andrew Cameron say it, you've heard myself say it, you've had yourself say it. You know, there is a certain fulfillment that we all get from teaching. Um, I will tell you two things. So you, you mentioned Buddhist. <laughs> My son, Tan, uh, 12 year olds. He is a self described Buddhist. Well, you've been calling him Buddhist since he was four. Dude, he was so bald he's and a little. He's a uh, Buddhist. He, he probably thinks Buddhist means like. No, uh, no, no, dude. He's researched it. He's researched it. He's just cool and laid back like that. He, he is a self. And I, I'm like, hey, listen, I'm glad you're Buddhist. There's a lot, you know, great religion and whatnot. So I support it. I support it. And two things. I was calling this guy all day long, okay? All day long. I kept anchoring back to him. And I kept calling him Rainy, okay, because his name is spelled R-A-N-I. How would you spell that? How, how would you pronounce it that? I would assume it, because of the I, it's uh, Ronnie. Man, am I just dumb? Because I, <laughs> I was saying Rainy all day long, all day long. And at the end of the day, I said, I have to ask you, is it Ronnie or Rainy? And he says, it's Ronnie, Matt. <laughs> said, why in the world did you let me go through that all day long? You know? oh, that's <laughs> why funny. did he's like I didn't have it in my heart to correct you. That's like, oh goodness 
great. Well, I've, I've worked with enough people in, from different cultures, you know, as a teacher, you know, and, and ha- that's one thing I love about Rich Dad Education is the ability to interact with so many different people. I don't ever assume I have the pronunciation right. So many times I'll ask up front. You know, because I don't want to do that all day long. If, oh, I, if I'm, I'm not the same, sure, I'm the same way, T. I, I mean, I have a ton of Indian <laughs> students, and you know, they have names that have different pronunciations and whatnot. It's a different language, and mm-hmm. I'm usually really, really good at that. And <laughs> Ronnie is just sitting there, going, just staring at me the whole day. Just doesn't change his expression. Just nodding his head, saying, "Yep, Matt. Yep, Matt. Yep, Matt." And at the end of the day, he's like, "No, I did in my heart to uh, to make you sound stupid." I'm like, "Yeah, I probably funny. said lots of stupid things to say. You, you know, that's just one more." Oh, you're Ra- you're Rainy. That's your name. It's Rainy from now on. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you that right now. If you don't think I'm not gonna call him Rainy tomorrow. <laughs> I am calling him Rainy for the rest of the workshop, but you know, let's let's bring it back here for a second. Two, two major things I want to hit before the end of the podcast. I have questions for you, so you got to count in like ten minutes for me. So if we can talk market conditions quick, that's that's fine. I can if tell not, you. I can tell you. I promise. I'm planning on giving you ten minutes for things you want to talk about. Yeah. I I intend to do this, um, whether it pans out that way or not. We'll, we'll see how it goes. Uh, but uh, no, I'm totally kidding. Totally kidding. A um, couple things I got for you. Okay, number one is the is the sell off we saw in the market this week more or less than what the market did this week? Is it the beginning of something else, or is it nothing to see here? Nothing to see here um, by definition. If if it ends up selling off more, pe- this is how silly talking heads come back and they rewrite uh, history. I mean, the market didn't really show a lot of volatility in the major indexes, no, just small not. caps. Those don't represent a huge part of the market, quite frankly. It's a nothing to see here because you only had two companies report earnings. The whole story is in front of us. Well, you know, Alcoa Wells Fargo earnings, kind of I, sold today, though, and Wells Fargo is like has like 17 straight quarters of beating expectations. Yeah. Um, you know, Alcoa, or Alcoa went up a little bit. But I'll tell you this right now, and this is just a, a sense I have as a trader being over the years. Um, and I agree with you, T, 100%. Nothing to see here right now, right? Uh, self and the small and mid-cap stocks, who cares? Uh, but uh, the S&P, the Dow, even the NASDAQ, you know, just came, all they did is come into the 20-day moving average. <laughs> you know, something that, you know, we've been wanting for a while, right? Um, yeah. But at the same time, I have just a feeling and this is nothing empirical. It's obviously just a feeling, but there's a sense that there's a growing sense of fear out there. And um, the Portugal news that came out a couple of days ago, that was something unexpected. You know, I was expecting this to be about earnings this uh, this this quarter, this this next few weeks, about how they had to beat expectations and and soundly beat expectations. But the news that came out about Europe, I think that I think it's concerning. I really do. Uh, it reminds me a little bit about 2011, not to the degree, obviously, but a little bit about 2011 when we were dealing with the European debt crisis. Now, obviously, we were getting news out of Europe every other week back in 2011 and early 2012. This is like every other quarter right now. But at the same time, it's it's something I think that is uh, uh, spooks the market just a tad bit. Yeah, I don't doubt that it does. I mean, people were talking about it. It is significant. Anytime you hear bank failure or insolvency or any any words like that that trigger, it's like uh, somebody with post traumatic stress disorder. You know, it's, it reminds traders or or bankers that have been through market cycles like that. It brings us back to those thoughts. Mm-hmm. But what did the VIX do? You didn't see a big spike in the VIX. Yeah, I mean, ten to eleven. You know, nothing. Nothing. They're not Matt. They're their money is not telling us that they're worried. Their words might be, but you're not seeing a lot of protection well, being bought, I mean, insurance honestly, being T, bought. This week in the VIX, uh, it went from 1040 all the way up to spike to 1325 in a week. You know, obviously mm. settled around 1250 today. So you went up two dollars in the VIX. That's a 20 percent clip in volatility. The day that I will agree with somebody when they tell me a 13 VIX is high. A 13 VIX is well high in the re- shoes, Listen, Matt. a 13 VIX is high in relationship to 10, <laughs> right? Yes. I, mean, yeah. <laughs> I mean, how far can it go from 10? You know, I, I mean, shit. If it gets down to 10 again, I might put my to- my whole account on call options on the VIX. I, uh, I guess I, I will 
not worth the debate on that point. I think I understand your point. I think you get my point. It's that even when there is risk in the market lately, it still just reminds you of how locked in these bankers are, Matt. No, I, I agree. And the 13 VIX is not volatile. Let's just make sure everybody is clear on that. You know, but uh, I'm just saying with the VIX being at 10 and, you know, all time lows, where else is it going to go? Uh, just the, uh, the idea, like, um, I probably should, I probably have had nightmares just dreaming about the VIX popping between 10 and 15 over time, just living in that world oh, forever. I, I would love to see a sell off, you know, from a, from a trader's perspective, I would love to see the market sell off. I would want to believe it's like Cleveland fans right now. I know that they oh, believe right how now. Can we went 40 minutes with talk, talking about the news of LeBron James, the prodigal uh, son going back to Cleveland. Hey, listen, I am a big, big comedy fan, and I am in with Cat Williams on this one. Haters going to hate. That's All right? Sure. I'll tell you right you, now, um, and maybe, maybe, maybe you agree, maybe you don't. I love it. You know, and I, I, I'm kind of a Miami fan in general, you know, being a Dolphin fan for the years that, that I have been. I'm not a homegrown Heat fan. I'm a homegrown Utah Jazz fan. But I'm just – I love just – people who just excel in anything if you yeah. eat if you eat the record amount of hot dogs i'm your biggest fan okay what's his name Ko, kobashi Kobayashi. Like kobayashi no, that, or, yeah. yeah whatever yeah, yeah. huge fan huge fan i can't pronounce his name don't remember him but a huge fan uh kobe bryant tiger woods lebron james michael jordan you know people that are just amazing at what they do and excel at what they do I love success. I just, I love success. I think it breeds other people to want to be successful. Um, and I, I agree with you with Cat Williams. Let the haters hate, brother. So you like watching a skinny Asian kid stuff 50 hot dogs in his face? Hell yes, I do. Are you kidding me? <laughs> do you know the skill set for a guy that weighs 39 pounds to be able to eat 75 hot dogs in, th in like a minute and a half? That's amazing. Americans, uh, Americans should worship that. I I got a joke here, but I'd lose the religious side of our audience if there's still any left. Um, I did but, a deep friend <laughs> a uh, person on Facebook today for making a religious comment on uh, Obama and Islam. Oh yeah, I did. I couldn't take any long. I just I was done with it. That's just ridiculous to me. Well, do you find yourself as the type of person that could put up with so much until it's just too much is too much? Uh, when I was younger, I would basically whatever it took to make them feel silly about themselves. Yeah. Um, I'm 36 years old. I got four kids and bills. I don't care what somebody else thinks. You know, yeah. let let whatever what anybody else wants to think, let them think whatever they want to do. It's 2014 with technology. Everybody's going to point out ignorance. Well, I mean, you know, it takes me back to philosophy days. Same thing in markets. You know, you, do, do you examine? And this actually ties in to what I wanted to talk to you about. But I, I want to hold off on it. I don't want to change topics too far until we finish our conversation about on, volatility you want to in these stay markets. On ignorance and religion? Is that what you're It, it actually fits exactly. I had three questions I'm going to ask you, and uh, it fits perfectly into that. So why don't we just run with it now? We can talk about the market. We can finish up next week in the market. Maybe the last thing we'll talk about before we wrap the podcast. By the way, you are listening to the Trading Justice Podcast. This is Tim Justice with my brother Matt Justice. We don't know who the host is. We're still trying to like uh, have this epic battle over who the alpha and the beta is in this relationship. You know, but, nobody uh, actually questions who's the alpha. Only you do. Well, well, maybe we have to battle out who's going to be more productive as a host. And maybe you guys can let us know mm. in the comments thread who you think uh, would do a better job. Um, I don't know if I'd win that, by the way. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. See, there's more Matt fans just, or Tim fans. I just got fearful. I was looking through some old notes of mine. I cleaned out my desk. I even put a post on our site about this, uh, and th actually on the Facebook site. And this was from one of the a book that I read on the art of thinking and the guy had a chapter. I finally got to, I went through all the chapters that I wrote notes on and I, he got to a chapter on how to broaden your perspective and the basic premise of the book and the author, you, I don't, I want to give him credits, Vincent Ryan Ruggiero, Ruggiero, something like that. R-U-G-G-I-E-R-O. 
uh, he has a really interesting perspective. He believes that th good thinking habits can be learned, that you don't have to just be stuck in what you were dealt, that uh, that whole it's the card you were dealt is, is bogus, that with enough practice, construction, a proper way of thinking, you know, can be trained. And that's actually something that we teach, Matt, is that just because you were taught one way doesn't mean we can't reshape and rewire the way you think about money and opportunity and life. And he he mentioned three key areas to be an individual. This is this was the what I wrote in my notes. He said there's three basic steps to being an individual. And I'm going to ask you about all three of these. And you tell me what you found in not only your own experiences but other people on how they can go about achieving this. Okay. So he says to be an individual, there's three basic steps. Number one, you have to acknowledge the influences that have shaped your thinking. I, w I would agree with that. You have to acknowledge where you came from, your, your foundation, your socialization. Yeah, I would agree with that. Is that something that many people do on their own or does it require somebody from the outside kind of chipping in? You know, oh, in, in, in a position the, of trust or something. Politically correct answer. I mean, no, I don't. I don't think people have the ability on their own, outside of extreme examples, to admit their own, their own, you know, faults, their own socialization. We we don't recognize we're being socialized uh, yeah. because the truths that we believe in are the truths that we've believed in our whole lives. It's you know, I remember being a 20 year old kid going to college at SUU, right, Southern Utah University, studying poli sci and history. And I was in a, uh, I was in a city, a little small town called, uh, Paragon. You know where Paragon is. And, uh, it's a real small town, right? And it was during the election of George Bush, his first term. And we were doing exit polls. And I remember handing out the exit polls to everybody. And you know how on the ex, on the exit poll, how did you vote? And, or whatever the case might be. And you can put either all Republican, all Democrat, or you can vote individually, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, the great, great majority of those people, all Republican, constantly, all Republican, all Republican. I think like 90% was all Republican. And I remember asking some of the people, even as a 20-year-old kid, you know, obviously a poli-sci student, which, you know, when you're a 20-year-old poli-sci student, you're quite liberal. But, uh, you know, even even as a 20-year-old kid, I, I, would, I would ask the people, so why did you just vote all Republican? Why didn't you go down the, the list? And they would say... Well, my daddy did it, and his daddy did it, and my granddaddy did it, so I'm going to do it too. And, you know, it's just that's, that was the mindset. They didn't even have any clue that why they, they – they didn't even have the ability to question whether or not voting for a Republican was the same in 2000 as it was in 1940. You know, uh -huh. the Republican Party was the Republican Party, and it has been the Republican Party for the last 200 years. And sure. anybody who has ever studied poli-sci knows that the Republican and Democrat principles have changed over time. And so it's just like you truly have no idea or ability to question whether or not your actions are consistent with your beliefs. Yeah, I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. And, you know, you see it in so many different ways. I don't have – I mean it could go anywhere from religion to social issues to politics. I mean anything you can think about. And I, I – think that even myself, I constantly – I think it's a lifelong process obviously. It's not something that just because at one point you did acknowledge your influences, maybe there's a whole different set of influences, not even necessarily just on your outwardly held beliefs but your inwardly held beliefs, oh, yeah. You know, the honesty you have with yourself or whatever it may be. And to me, this is where – outside mentoring and coaching and having people around you you trust that aren't just yes men is such an important part in life in trading in business i mean just in self development so when he wrote when i wrote the, you know i'm reading these notes and i see that first one acknowledges the influences that have shaped your thinking that could be the positive ones see and i think what happens sometimes is like when i read that the first thing i thought of was exactly what you thought of some of the ones that might have been a negative, you know, channeling us one way or the other, but also the positive influences that shaped our thinking. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Robert Kiyosaki, he's shaped my thinking in a positive way. Um, other people, colleagues, yourself, you know, it's it's good to to find your winners too. Well, I, 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 let me just speak to that for just a second. I'll tell you, probably more than anything, and I think this is consistent in everything. We take on the personality. And the traits of the people we surround ourselves with. 
And when you surround yourself with dirtbags, you have a tendency to, to act like a dirtbag. When you surround yourself with the successful-minded people, you have a tendency to act as successful-minded people. And, you know, you, you said Robert Kiyosaki, and obviously he has had just an absolutely massive influence on both of us uh, from a context perspective, from a mindset perspective. But I'll tell you right now, people like Jeff Crystal and Noah Davidson and, and Gino Poor and Keith King and um, some of the other amazing mentors at Rich Dad Education uh, that have, you know, we have gotten to know and, and just been just the absolute benefit, you know, of getting to know these types of individuals over the course of, you know, years, my client hands and, you know, those individuals. Being able, to, those people have shaped my thinking as much as anybody else. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm with you. And there's, you know, more to that. I want to get to number two here. He says to sort out and evaluate your ideas and attitudes. Mm -hmm. You know, and I was actually thinking about this. You know, you probably would need a pen and a paper. You ever do that old, you know, pros and cons or whatever, and maybe you could make a column with ideas and attitudes. Mm -hmm. And they say that uh, when you do, like, I don't know if you've ever done any free writing where they say, like, the first four or five things, anything that that comes out of your, your mouth when you're doing free thinking out loud or free writing on a page usually are not the best ideas because those are the ones that you had preconceived in the first place. Mm -hmm. So I think that what you'd have to do to really sort out and evaluate your ideas and attitudes is you would have to list them and keep listing them and keep listing them until you were basically exhausted. Well, have you ever wrote, written down those two or three initial thoughts and then for the next 30 minutes to 60 minutes – wrote everything that questioned the validity of what you just thought was the truth. Sure. Just in your own inter perspective and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah. It, well, I'm a natural skeptic. Um, yeah. So I, I'm always challenging ideas and whatnot, willing to accept, uh, you know, fact if I can see it as fact, but because there is truth in things. Like um, I really believe that. I don't think everything's just subject or objective. I think there is truth. Uh, I believe in the truth of, the human spirit that if you have a positive attitude you want to go out and influence the world that makes you a more productive and happier person just from having that internal attitude about it and that goes back to some of those buddhist buddhist beliefs we were talking about earlier yeah, a little my bit son, man. he's going to be right? an amazing amazing positive person and then the third one and this is where i don't the the last word is a tricky one and i don't know if how Maybe I don't have enough faith in humanity, but I don't know if most people could do this. He says then to choose the best ones objectively. Uh, like, that has to go again. I mean, because a lot of what our internal belief system is based on is our socialization, where we live, where we grew up, the people that we that we grew up with, and to question the validity of those internal belief systems has to question your entire upbringing. And I think that's very, very difficult, even though I think I think it's I think most people understand that this is a really big world and not everything that we were, you know, you know, built upon is a foundation of truth and faith and justice. Uh, but at the same time, that's that's extremely difficult to question some of your internal belief systems. I think it's hard. I think it's and, and it does get down to trading. I'm I'm a big proponent and I really believe trading is not complicated. It's the psychology it's behind it that you have to tackle. And so these kinds of topics to me are more important than teaching somebody where to watch for a stochastic cross. You know, I'm sure there are you engineers that are listening to this stuff right now. To that, watch for a stochastic cross? You, right. Just, what I'm saying is I think it's more important to tackle the psychology behind success and to make sure you're building your, your proper mindset than it is to memorize all of the candlestick. Well, I, I don't know if it's more, but I will say it's as important. It is as important to tackle the psychology, the mindset, and the context of a trader as it is the, the okay, here's a bullish retracement. Here's the criteria for a retracement. Here's a breakout. Here's confirmation. Here's the rules for trading an option strategy. Here's the rules for selling a naked put, whatever it is. It is vital to have the context. And, and, and that's one of the reasons, because both of us believe in that inherently, that's one of the reasons why, you know, a lot of what we do on the podcast, not everything obviously, but a lot of what we do on the podcast is based around the context and the mindset of a trader because it doesn't matter if you know the rule. If you don't have the mindset, you're going to fail. 
Well, and, and this is where I wanted to go with this next is I, I did this for myself tonight, Matt, before our podcast, but in the context only about my own trading and my trading experiences. I sat down and I went through these three steps and I thought about the influences that shaped my thinking, the people I met, the experiences I had, the market conditions I lived through, the books I read, um, being a teacher, having to teach other people, that, that, that kind of stuff. I try to sort out and evaluate my ideas, my attitudes, when I like to trade, what I like to trade, why I came about that. And I really thought hard, are there, are there things I'm missing? You know, because I've been trading a long time. I, I don't want to be the kind of person that gets into such a strict routine to where I'm not open to new ideas. You don't want to be that old dog that can't learn a new trick, you know. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about this and then like try to find the best ones objectively. And it got me down, and I don't know the answer to this yet, but it got me down to asking questions about the difference between theta, theta scalping, theta trading, whatever you want to call it and directional gamma scalping. And those terms probably just scared the hell out of 90% of our listeners. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Tim, that's, that would take me hours to explain all that in detail. Basically, the idea of whether you want to you know, go for consistent cash flow or you're going to go for big, big home run swings. Which one is better long term? And I couldn't, I couldn't come up with an answer, Matt. I don't think either one really is better. But one thing that I did, and I put this on my piece of paper, is, is that if you don't have the context, you can't be the home run hitter. I, I, I agree with that. But I want to come back first, just one second with what you said, um, the consistent cash flow. When you're teaching somebody new how to trade, you know, you're, you're yeah. given a three-day workshop, you know, yeah. it's easier to show somebody the greed of buying an option. Would you, would you agree with that? Oh yeah, people get excited about that, and they should. But that, yeah, it's a lot. I think it's a lot easier for the audience to get excited about that. Yes. But as a buyer of an option, are you going to have long-term success if all you are is a buyer? Um, I will. Yes. Uh, not new traders. Most. New new traders, though. No, not not many. Not, if that's the only thing they did, they would probably struggle because of the lack of context or money management systems built in. See, yep. I, I'm willing to bet that coming to a workshop that I do versus what a lot of other seminar you know, instructors do, that it's much more difficult to understand the things that I'm talking about because I talk about positive theta trading. I talk about theta yeah. targeting. I talk about you know credit spreads. And, I, I, and I, I even tell people, if all you do is come into the market and just buy initially, you're going to get everything taken from you. And not everybody can get that. But at the same time, I feel a responsibility to people to teach it the right way. You know, not just pe get people excited. But, you know, there's a reason that there's a broker statistic for retail traders, right? There's mm -hmm. a reason that that broker statistic is two to four months. That, that new traders come into the market and they last two to four months before they're no longer trading. And that's because all they do is buy. That's it. They have the buyer's yeah. mentality. They have a buyer's mindset. They don't understand what selling is. They don't understand that there's an opposite end to every transaction, correct? And you got to teach people the proper mindset. You got to teach people the proper techniques to be able to go out there and cash flow in the market, consistent cash flow in the market. Well, let, 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 let me go through a hypothetical with you. Let's say that you start out as a buyer in the market and the first month you jump in and let's say you're actually really good with your money management. You had a trainer or teacher that taught you real strict money management. You never risk more than 1% or 2% or whatever it is, whatever you want to, less than risk of ruin theory. Okay. Yeah. Say you're really good with your money management and you got into the market in the first month, your account's down 2%. Second month, you're down 3%, total of 5%. Third month, you break even, but now you're three months in. The fourth month, you make a percent, and you're basically spinning your wheels. Do you have the patience as a new trader to hit even a, go into that fifth month with the same energy and vigor that you did the first and second month? No. Most people wouldn't. No, they don't. Because because even the best, there are good directional traders, Matt, but they have the context of years and years of trading. 
you know, to embrace that side of the model, you have to know what distribution of results are supposed to look like and understand it. Well, you know, I was, I was trying to tell this to a group the other day that you can do your job perfectly. It doesn't necessarily mean you'll win on that trade. Mm -hmm. Well, the you market could go against you. There's lots of variables. Yeah. And maybe that fifth month, maybe they did hit a big home run that month and made 25% or something. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody like Bollinger, like I read a statistic, maybe it was even you who told me. Bollinger, who does a lot of directional trading, the guy who wrote Bollinger Bands, so I don't know what's his first name. John Bollinger, and uh, he actually, you know, I was listening to a webinar Bollinger did. And uh, Bollinger, basically, he was reviewing his portfolio over the last year. This is 2013. And uh, he had a lot of base hits, a lot of base hits. But his account, you know, his net total gain after the year was the combination of just a few trades. I mean, Bollinger probably made thousands of trades that year. And yeah. the, the highest percent gain he had for the entire portfolio was based on a couple out-of-the-money call options that he hit for basically home runs. Yeah. And that's what directional traders know is that they can take thousands of trades directionally if they have good technical systems and, and make it work. But do you think Bollinger would ever once question his models, you know, if he had two or three months where he was no. only doing base hits or up a little or down a little? No. I don't think, I don't think, you know, Bollinger would do that. And I don't think, and, and, but at the same time, Tim, I'll be honest with you. I don't think a new trader could trade like Bollinger out of the gate to be successful. That's the problem. See, and that's what I got down to. And that's where this whole thinking, this uh, three-step evaluation, it really struck me is, okay, I'm going to do this myself. I'm going to go through this about trading. And what are the best models? You know, Because I'm a big believer that you can make any model work with the proper money management, the proper context, the proper training. So There's lots of systems out there. Yeah, you can go long. You can theta trade. And one of the things, if you're new to trading, that you should be asking a lot of questions about to other traders, you know, in your classes, your, your instructors, whatever, is what should I expect over this amount of time? You know, even a really basic thing, Matt, like um, putting on a swing trade. You know, a, let's say an average chart, a, you're looking at a chart, and it moves from pivot to pivot over the course of about, on average, six to eight days. Yeah. In real market time for a beginner, Six to eight days might feel like a lifetime. It's that guy that was up there in front of the room three minutes. It felt like three hours to him, right? Yeah. For a new trader, a six or eight day trade might seem like forever. I have a student, and she, you know her. Uh, she's in our Monday lab. Uh, you'll know who I'm talking about. She has the patience of about one day, even though she knows better. Yeah. I do yeah. know who you're talking about. Yes. She, she knows better and she knows she's supposed to execute a plan, but she has the patience of about one day. And that's just because she's new. You yeah, know? And if it goes against her, she completely questions it and wonders what in the world is going on. And, right. You know, but at the same time, uh, she's dedicated, she's disciplined, and I think, and she's willing to stick with it and learn from it. It's just going to take her some time to learn it. That's it. And that's one of our jobs, I think, and one of the reasons why we do this podcast is to bring up topics like this, to give context to it. Because, you know, you and I, we've been trading 10 years, but it, it feels like 50 oh, because yeah, of all absolutely. the people I've trained. Um, you know, I'm not only trading all day, but I'm working with traders all day. So I get to experience their accounts with my accounts and all at the same time. Yeah, we've, and, not, only, we've not only lived our, our trading experience, we've lived countless others. Yeah. And uh, and that's where context comes in. You know, any these any of these systems can be profitable for you. And you, it's really important that if you are developing a new system, that you understand the expectations, so that when you do go through drawdowns, you know what to expect. You don't beat yourself up. You don't lose as, your confidence. As long and you don't throw your rules though, out here's the, the disclaimer though: as long as you're trading a system, if mm -hmm. you're if you're not trading a system and it's just completely. You know, let's wing it. Let's go out there and let's buy this option and buy this option because we think we're going to make a lot of money. And all of a sudden, you you have a drawdown, 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 and you start questioning trading as a whole because you don't have the proper perspective or the proper system. That can be dangerous. You know, if 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 you don't have a proper system that you're trading, then it's never going to work long term, never. And you're going to question it, and then all of a sudden, you're going to be the guy or the lady that comes back and says trading's gambling. Yeah, no, I mean, that's exactly right. Trading a system, you know, you have to develop that. And, 
it's so exciting once you when some of those light bulbs come on and it's exciting as the person that's the most excited you're going to feel even as a teacher somebody on the outside you know watching people's light bulbs click on as they start to get it mm -hmm. It's one of my favorite things to see. You know, they start to understand, oh, yeah, that's why I have to have a stop loss or that's why I have to always set the, my position size as this many contracts and I can't violate it. Yeah, no, yeah. I, I, I agree with that. Um, I do want to shift topics real quick. And I want to ask yeah, you, we, got, we got to wrap soon. The hell we do. Um, <laughs> and I want to talk about something real quick. Let's give some – let's give the audience – you know what they're craving and what they're craving is how to make some money trading and so I want to shift it to earnings this season and okay. a lot of people they fear earnings because they don't understand earnings earnings is one of the most uncertain events in the entire marketplace you know it, anybody who says you have a probability of a gapping up or down completely and utterly lie you don't know how the market's going to respond to the earnings report. You don't know how the market's going to respond to guidance. You don't know what their true expectation is. You know, both of us have seen a, an absolutely amazing earnings report and the market sold it. And we've seen the worst earnings report in the history of mankind and the market bought it. It's all based on expectation. So I want to mm -hmm. ask you a couple of questions. As an investor, okay, long term, own stock, how do you approach earnings? Oh, interesting. So an individual stock, probably the appropriate approach is to assess the downside gapping risk and whether you're willing to take it, assess the fundamentals, and either buy insurance or don't based on your assessment. And the insurance would be a form of a put option. As a long-term investor, if you're already holding earnings. Now, uh, an investor wouldn't just go out and play something in front of the earnings speculating. They're in the stock because they've researched fundamentals or it's part of a – got a good dividend. They're writing cover calls on it, you know, Whatever, those types yeah. of things. But let me give you two examples okay? because you said something. Should we buy insurance? Should we not buy insurance? When, when you mention buying insurance, that's basically in the market it's called a protective put option. When you buy, an ins when you buy a put option to insure against the downside risk. Let me give you two examples just to give the audience you know, a, a context for what you're talking about. Uh -huh. Let's say we have two companies. You have MTJ company trading at $100. You have XYZ company trading at $100. MTJ company over the last four earnings season has averaged a 2% gap. Okay. XYZ company has averaged a 8% gap. Which company do you buy insurance on and why? By the way, those happen to be your initials, and I think 2% is your vertical right now. Um, Dude, don't you dare go there. <laughs> don't you dare go there. Yes, MTJ is a fundamentally strong company. Okay, good valuations, good verticals. At what's least two, what's three two percent or of four six or feet? five or maybe – Five and a half, but seventy-two you know. told <laughs> us like I got. No, let's like, just say it's not Andrew Wiggins vertical. Let's just say that. How about we just uh, <laughs> let's go with there. I am not as high as Andrew Wiggins. I'm anywhere between forty-four inches and two inches. Let the audience do the guesswork themselves. But no, it's not Andrew Wiggins. You're an asshole. Answer the question. <laughs> so no, I had the joke lined up in my head at when you started the thing so I didn't hear the question the 2% and the 8% okay so you've got the one company that averages 2% the other one has 8% yeah so is the basic question which one has more risk no 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 which one do you buy insurance on Oof. Um, you might think there's an obvious answer there you probably buy insurance on the 8% gap obviously mm -hmm. if you're not willing to take on that risk, but if you had position, if that's just one of your small growth stocks that you only have like one percent of your portfolio in, you may be willing to take on an eight percent risk if it's got the accompanied eight percent potential upside too. Tell it's me a, one it's a person. Risk tolerance question. Tell me one person you know that position size in the stock market at one percent. Only bankers. Exactly. <laughs> so stop it. Answer the question. Do not sit there and get on the fence with me. Eight right, percent. You, 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 you buy you okay. buy the insurance on the more risky thing. Just like if you lived in a world, this is the analogy I always use uh, to to tell people to explain how insurance in the options market works. Imagine you lived in a world where the government told you 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 don't have to have car insurance, 
and you can you can buy it on a day by day basis if you want it. Are you going to buy insurance on a Sunday when you know and it's nice outside when you know you're only going to the gas station and back maybe once or twice? Or are you going to buy it when you know you got to make a long road trip and there, it's snowing outside? You can buy it when it's snowing outside. Same thing between the two and the eight percent. The eight percent is the snowstorm. You decide to buy insurance. See, that's the great thing about the stock and the options market. You get to determine when you want insurance. Mm -hmm. You don't. The market doesn't determine it for you. They don't mandate it like the government does. Free market. So well, you do it on the eight percent company. I'll give you the easy answer. I won't make it too complicated. Let me let me give you an analogy real quick. I was in class yesterday, right? And yeah. I asked basically I asked, okay, how many of you own homes? And out of the, the people that owned a home, there was like a combined 1,280 months that people had owned a home and were paying insurance. And I asked them, so why do you pay insurance? And they said, well, you know, what if it burns down, Matt? You know, what if, what if a hurricane comes? What if a tornado comes? What if this? You guard against calamity. You guard against the house burning down, right? And I said, okay, out of, out of all of you individuals that have, that have paid insurance for 1,280 months, how many times have you guys filed a claim? And Tim, this was, this is a low sample size, obviously, a small sample size, but there were two individuals that had filed one claim against 1,280 months. It literally came to a 0.001% probability of you know, finally filing a claim against a home. And one of those two was me. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> because when I had the water damage from, uh, a, a, you know, eight months ago. And so literally we pay insurance every month to own a home. You know, obviously we have to, but at the same time, we do it to protect against a 0.001% probability of, of something bad happening. Well, in an earnings, in an earnings season, there's a 50% probability that your stock will go down. A 50% probability. And yet yeah. nobody, nobody, well, I shouldn't say nobody, you know, institutions, hedge funds, professional traders and whatnot do it. But the retail investor, nobody buys insurance on their stock, which is a greater asset than their house. And I, when I was talking to them about that, they're like, oh, my God, I hate Allstate. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's what everybody is like, don't hate Allstate, guys. Just learn, just learn, and I gave him the same the same analogy you did. What if there was a 50-50 probability you would get in a wreck, and I gave you an opportunity to buy insurance the day before? Would you do it? Absolutely. But if I told you there was a 0.001% probability, would you buy insurance? No, it wouldn't be worth it. Uh -huh. You know, and and so that's what that, that's what you're talking about. The stock market gives you a, a and the options market. They give you an option to buy insurance against calamity, and it's well, in the and form of protective put option. A lot of people are probably wondering, well, how do you know the one is going to do two percent, the other one is eight percent, which we kind of glossed over. Eight, the math average gap yeah. against the last four earnings. I mean, yeah, it's well, also yeah, the money straddle. There's little math things. Well, you can and the do. market That's maker you move. Classes. You know, the market maker move that is based on the average gap and the you know, implied volatility of the front month and all that jazz. But there's there's actually simple ways, right? You have the market yeah. maker move. You have the app at the money strata price for the closest expiration that includes the uh, the earnings report. And in, in, even outside of all that, just average the gap range over the last four earnings reports, and that's going to give you a, an expectation. And that's where we get the two to eight percent. And that's 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 how we that's how we approach earnings. Everything is a probability in a numbers game. Oh, a hundred percent. And you know what's interesting, Matt, is I mo a lot of the studies I've done because I do a lot of testing studies. It comes from I it comes from my background in loving numbers, loving just compiling data, just like you did when you were uh, doing the poll testing at the you know George Bush election in two thousand, where you're just writing down numbers. I would be the guy back in the you know. Doc Roberts' office, and we would be running numbers, and I would have to tabulate all that stuff. And he would always tell me, "Don't draw a conclusion until you've got a big enough sample size." Mm -hmm. Basic, you know, principle and statistics. And one of my most extensive set of spreadsheets I ever developed was based on this. And I won't go. This is a whole podcast, but it was based on this idea that I could find where the gap, which direction was going to, it was going to gap. I thought I could do it based on the idea of assessing the volatility skew between the call and the put options on average. And that would help me understand which side the market was kind of predicting. 
long story short, weeks and weeks of research led me to no conclusion. Uh, I'll just tell you, I'll bet against it. Whatever, yeah. whatever, whoever had more call options versus put options, I'd bet against it because that's that is complete. That's like the sharks betting against the the you know retail gambler. Sure, um, but at the yeah. same time, there's no probability. I'd just say because I'd bet against them. I'd bet against the average market. No, it was inconclusive. Now yeah. I'm yawning. I'm realizing we've been on our podcast for an hour and fifteen minutes. Hopefully, um, I'm loving it though. By the way, yawn's just long week. What a week! But you know, uh, it's, I'm, it's yeah. Friday night. I'll tell you the dedication right here. Friday night. It's eleven o'clock my time. It's nine o'clock your time right now. Um, yeah. I gotta wake up at uh, six thirty Eastern Standard Time, and oh my wow, I can't stand the East Coast. I just can't stand it. It, it, it. I love the cities back here, by the way. I love New York. I love Boston. Love Philly. Just love the East Coast. Um, I love the mindset. I love the people. I love the the just the the history of it all. Right. DC is one of my favorite towns in the history of mankind. But at the same time, I am a night owl from the West Coast. You know, so on the East Coast time, when I got to wake up at six thirty to go teach a bunch of people, I got three hours sleep. It feels like four thirty. So basically, you actually love the East Coast, but you hate time zones. You don't have to run down the whole East Coast by saying I can't stand the East Coast. You actually just named like nineteen things that you love about the East Coast. You just don't like time zones. I hate the East Coast. No, <laughs> you can't even admit when you're if, wrong. If people want to take that as I hate the people, that's on them. <laughs> I hate these ghosts because I have to stay up much later than I normally do. Um, but yeah, I want to ask you one last thing, Tim. Okay, that's as an investor, as a trader. Okay, as a trader, an active trader, volatility, Vega type strategies. How do you approach making money during the earnings season? Well, rather than specifics, because there's too many strategies, I will just encourage just this thought, this this idea, and for people to embrace it. Earnings happen every three months. If you can't trade earnings season, or if you can't trade two weeks before a stock has earnings or two weeks after a stock has earnings, you're basically out of the market. Four months out of the year, 33% of the time. I mean, if you're talking two weeks and two weeks, uh, yeah, you're out of the market 30% of the time. So there are two things you have to start watching and don't turn your brain off. Turn your brain on. Check back in. When you see a gap, maybe you don't trade it because you haven't been trained on gaps or it confuses you, whatever, but watch it. Watch the gap. See how it behaves after. Look, watch for the volatility. Try to understand the difference between a breakaway gap, you know, or a gap fill and the intraday action that follows from that. Um, yeah. And when you see strategies taught in a class like calendar spreads, Vegas strategies, inverted butterflies, project volatility, practice those because they're as a trader, Matt. You you look at earnings as an opportunity. Well, that's I, when honestly, you get the Tim, I, I I think earnings is one of the biggest opportunities out there. Number one, it's not only about the gap because a gap can be a significant opportunity and people get a little nervous about gaps because it throws out, you know, average movements and average probabilities. But, you know, there's five main types of gaps. You have common gaps, which are not based on earnings. Then you have runaway gaps and, you know, breakaway gaps, exhaustion gaps, and catastrophic gaps. A gap can signify a tr an extreme movement to one side or the other. And if you have the ability to analyze the gap after the earnings, if it, it can be a significant profit potential in that capacity. That's number one. Number two, earnings is primarily about volatility uh, from an option standpoint. As about four to six weeks prior to earnings, you're going to see volatility start to increase. And one of the reasons it starts to increase is because people are buying insurance, which inherently in, you know increases the price of options. And so as volatility increases, the price of options are going to increase. And so it, it goes back to that old adage, buy low, sell high, but you're not buying low, sell high in the stock market or the options market. You're doing it based on volatility. And so learning strategies like straddles, long straddles and long strangles, you know, four to six, seven weeks before earnings, taking advantage of a non-directional movement, it's called the bi-directional trade, taking advantage of a bi-directional trade, just simply profiting based on volatility. You know, I was looking at uh, a couple Vegas strategies today, Tim, and, and that's, that goes back to, you know, you know, you come to one of my workshops, I'm going to push you. I'm going to teach you the proper ways. 
and uh, we were doing some volatility trades in a three-day workshop, the initial introductory. And I was saying, I don't want you to focus on the stock. I don't want you to focus on technical analysis. I want you to focus on this blue line. And I was in Thinkorswim, and I was like, where's the blue line right now? You know, this is how you teach new traders, right? Where's the blue line right now? It's low. Well, before earnings, and I went and showed them, you know, the last four earnings report, where is it? Where's the blue line then? And it's high. Well, if we buy it low and sell it high, do we make money? They said yes. And so I went out there and I risk graphed three or four of them. And this was based on, you know, last earnings season. And, you know, uh, you know, volatility based companies like Decker and CMG and, you know, Netflix and uh, Decker and uh, GMCR and, and stocks like that, as volatility is almost guaranteed to rise. I said, do you have profit potential? And we actually back tested it in the Thinkorswim on demand program. And honestly, Tim, I mean, just even a $2,000 position size, just simply based on volatility, would move into the four, four and a half, five thousand dollar range just based on volatility. And that's what people don't understand about trading options is trading options is not just about technical analysis. It's not about being right. It's not about direction or theta. Those are different types of strategies. In a volatility based strategy, it's all about vega. It's all about implied volatility. As four to six, seven weeks before earnings, you want to be a buyer of options. You do not want to be a directional buyer of options. You want to be a bi-directional of options. Buy a call, buy a put, you know, either at the money, which is called the straddle, or an out of the money, which is called the strangle. As volatility increases coming into earnings, after the earnings report, for the very reason that people are buying, uh, excuse me, buying protected put options, they don't they no longer have to have the reason to own those protected put options and so the day to two days after earnings guess what happens volatility crushes and so if you learn how to sell options at a high price you can buy them back after the earnings report at a low price that that would be like a short strangle or an inverted butterfly or if you wanted to enter into a longer term iron condor that could be something like that sell high you know buy low type of scenario earnings is all about you know average movements average probabilities and volatility and if you can learn those strategies, those techniques, and learn implied volatility, you could significantly profit during earnings. And for any active trader, earnings is one of the favorite seasons for an active trader. It's, it's, but at the same time, I'll tell you this. I am always happy as a pig in you know what when earnings is done and we can get back to normal trading. Mm -hmm. You know, the whole conversation just reminds me that I got to do some work Sunday night, start prepping all these stocks, you know, as part of your routine on a weekly basis. Got a hundred of them. Got a hundred S&P 500 companies reporting yeah. earnings next week, homeboy. Yeah, absolutely. It's, a it's big, exciting big times. Week. It's a big you know, week. And, and there's not a lot of companies that report Monday morning, so you can usually come in and do it Monday morning if you've got the time. But if you're working, I mean, you got to do that stuff maybe over the weekend. Tuesday through Thursday. Those are the biggest days. Tuesday yeah, through Thursday. Yeah, the most active. And Friday morning. Well, um, and you'll get some majors, but and next week you got a big financial week. You got the Morgan Stanleys, the J.P. Morgans, the Goldman Sachs. You got the you got the three-headed devil uh, coming out there and reporting earnings. We'll see how well they do next uh, next week. I you know I I've been filming this for a very long time. This earnings season is a very very important earnings season, and company uh, I still despite the international news, despite any economic news. I still feel that this earnings season is a vital moment for the next uh, for the next not only quarter, which it always is, but uh, just in terms of where we are in the overall market. I can't dispute that, my friend. I absolutely agree with that. I think that it's really important for if you're a, if you're on the bullish side of the market, you have to see the market at least swallow its pride if the earnings don't come in. Um, if you're I, a bear, you're to. looking for volatility to spike. Well, they have to. They, <laughs> I don't see how they can't. I do not see how they can have the valuations in the companies they have today with the lowered guidance. And if thus they overwhelm, I don't see how they can buy. But, you know, obviously, you know, anything can happen in the market. But that's just my kind of expectation. And that's one of the reasons why I'm taking a very cautious approach with a lot of my my trades but it's also why I'm, you know, heavy short on the Russell 2000 itself. Not the S&P 500, not the Dow Jones, because I've seen those two indexes and the Nasdaq go up, but the Russell go down in the last couple of weeks. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it's going to be an interesting and fantastic time. Um, I, I got to tell you this. I got an email from a student, and on Monday, and they said, "Oh man, 
bad day in the market. The market went down. I said, it depends on your perspective, my friend. Mm. It, that's true. It's always that's the way it is. You know, uh, it's not, and it, it depends on what stocks you trade and how you trade and what you were looking for. Obviously, you know, I I get um, I teach those labs, man. I always ask people how they're doing, and some people are always like, "I'm doing great, making money," and other people are like, "Oh, I had a bad day Friday." You know, it, it it is about personal selection. You have to make choices. You know. This isn't just some random distribution of numbers. There, if you have a system and you apply it consistently, you're going to be a lot better off, make a lot more money. I want to ask you a um, question before we're uh, finalized tonight. Tomorrow I, I got. Could, uh, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Both of us were trying to be polite right there. Go ahead. <laughs> Which is a rare thing. It never happens. I was going to ask first time you if you got me my song. Well, I, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here on my end, and you said you wanted the doors, right? Yeah, peace frogs. Peace frogs, you know, and you know, I, th I think you're right on that. I do, um, but I don't know if I can actually do that for you. What? What is this? Just hold on, my boy. Just get the head bobbing. Come on, name it. Name it. You you said this earlier tonight, by the way. You you mentioned this song earlier tonight. You yeah, ready? Man. Oh, come on. There we go. Classic song. Piano Man Live. Yep, Piano Man Live. There we go, man. The drunk himself. Yeah, one of my go-to like, like, karaoke songs. See, when you said uh, when you said the uh, you know we were at the Irish pub there in New York a few years back, five six years ago, and we literally brought the house down. You guys have no clue how many people were in this Irish no, pub no, watching no. two Justice Hicks from Emory County, Utah, bring down a New York oh, Irish club. It was amazing. No, and we were rocking this song, homeboy. You know, and I can't sing well, so I know how to pick karaoke songs well. You yeah. got to know your range. You have to. <laughs> piano man, piano man is our range. That's our range, right, right there. there. You know. Another one that is always a good go-to is Desperado, the Eagles. Oh yeah, oh yeah, I can see that. But it's not like Piano Man. This is like the number one karaoke song of all time. Yeah, which I'm, I'm way too hipster to sing this song. Oh man, I might rock it here on the. Song. I might rock it here on the podcast. You thought I wasn't going to do this. I am not uh, I'm shy. Gonna, I'm going to need like the flaming lips next I time am, or something. I am gaining confidence on this podcast. That's what I'm doing right now. I'm telling you right now. Um, I want to ask you a question though. As, as Piano Man sings us into the, into the past year, and I'm going to uh, close down the podcast. Tomorrow, night, tomorrow morning, I'm going to teach this amazing group of new traders in New York. And I'm going to basically end at 2 o'clock. I'm going to go get on my airplane and I'm, I'm going to leave. And I always give a final thought. And it's my motivational speech. And you're well, going to have the opportunity. Man. No, it's not going to happen. You're going to get – yes, it is. You are going to give me right now – you're going to tell me exactly what I'm going to tell that group tomorrow to get them to motivate to become traders. What should I tell them? All right, you have to turn Billy Joel off, and then I'll give you good advice. That's my compromise, because I'm questioning whether or not our audience can hear the Billy Joel. Because if they're hearing what I'm hearing, it's just in the background. Like, no, still got me. No, I still got you. Well, that's that. Which, by the way, I love a train wreck. So I could let you try to sing that on top of that audio dubbed, and uh, just let oh. you go with it, and let our audience have a good laugh. But the the advice I would give the group. So you're gonna let me come up with the advice that you're going to give your group tomorrow. Is that right? That is true. You you can give me the advice that I give them the advice tomorrow. Mm. So what would it be? You know, I'm trying to sum up my thoughts. I have about 10 of them, but then it brings me back to and I don't. I would. I need to look this up because I've quoted it, paraphrased it in the past. Google's original um, business plan. Yeah. We're going to change the way that people 
get information. You know, something like that, something really simple. I think maybe what I'd tell them is sometimes the best things that you can ever do in life is move forward with a purpose, you know, really commit. And you don't want to do anything half-assed. You know, if, if you're going to move forward and you're going to get into trading, make this a thing that you really focus on. Be passionate about it. Do it because you want to have another source of income. Do it because – and everybody's going to have their own reason. I don't need to give it to you. You know your reason. Mm -hmm. You know, Do it because of what you know it can do to help you change your life and how it can affect the way that you live on a day-to-day -day basis. I might even ask him, you know, when was the last time you just went on vacation? You had mentioned Washington, D.C. the other day, Matt, and uh, I took some dumb quiz on Facebook. You know, it says, like, what city do you belong to live in? Yeah. And uh, I expected them to tell me, like, Portland or Seattle because I'm a, you know, beatnik hipster. And um, it said Washington, D.C. And you know what I did is I went right on to check out what the cost of flights were to Washington, D.C., and I checked out the Washington Redskins football schedule, and I'm thinking about just taking a trip. You want to know why? Because I can. You can do yeah. whatever you want. I can trade from there. The I can run my classes hey, from there. The life of a trader right there. Have a nice little life weekend. Life of a yeah. trader. You know? And so maybe after, after having downloaded all those thoughts out there, maybe I would ask him is, do you want your freedom back? Because you can have it if you want it. Ooh. But you have to move forward with a purpose. Do you want your freedom back? And then you know what I'm going to do? Yeah, I'm gonna lay on the ground like Braveheart, or I'm gonna yell freedom. <laughs> That's what I'm gonna do. Because, oh, because Dean, I wish I had a Scottish accent. I would do some of the lines. <laughs> <laughs> great, 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 great movie. I'm gonna tell you what. If I can get Kathy, who is my manager out here, if I can get Kathy to record my closing remarks, I'm gonna do it and post it on the website. And uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna go on a. Uh, uh, a freedom kick. That's what I'm gonna do because that's what you just uh, you gave me the motivation to do it, my friend. Yeah, I think it's true you know, though. I I do I do I think a lot of people feel like they're handcuffed recently. I th I feel a lot of people like uh, feel like they they don't know there's an alternative, and it's time you take the shackles down and you scream freedom before you get drawn and quartered and posted on every you know area of England. Yep, that's absolutely right. You've been listening to the Trading Justice Podcast. If you've enjoyed yourself and think that the conversations and topics we've covered are important, help spread the word. Give us your feedback. Five stars on iTunes, like us on Facebook, and follow us on Twitter. The Trading Justice Podcast is proudly sponsored by TackleTrading.com. Get off the sidelines and get in the game. <laughs>